If the United States is a melting pot of peoples and cultures, the state of Louisiana may be fairly described as a gumbo. The contributions of the French and Spanish are well known, but because we are the inheritors of all who have gone before us and the conservators of our past for those who follow after us, we need to look at the other ingredients, the other parts of the recipe that is Louisiana. A strong, hearty flavor is provided by the German people who are notable contributors to the development of our state and to the development of each of us. This, then, is the story of Louisiana with a German accent. We begin not with the fabled city of New Orleans and its French settlers, but at an area named for the hardy people who settled it. We begin on the German coast. At that particular time, Germany had been ravaged by the Napoleonic Wars. And there was a great deal of poverty, a great deal of oppression, also religious oppression. And there was no hope for them in the old world, so they took the chance of coming to the new world. It and was fertile ground. For fertile them. ground for, for the people who had been oppressed over in the old country to come to a, a country that they didn't know very much about. It took the lives of thousands and thousands of them, but they were willing to come and take the chance. That's the way the uh, German coast, uh, Germania Alamant, was organized in the early days of the 19th century. And uh, that was perhaps the main reason that they came. So the uh, situation in Germany, on the whole, was very bad at that time. As you know, we had this little uh, small ice age, as we call it, with wet summers, bad yields, uh, people starved for hunger, uh, then the, the, what, what had, uh, been done as damage uh, during the 30 years war still was uh, uh, was not forgotten so it was a terrible time for them and when someone came to tell them you will have a good life over there I so rich there in America and so uh, they, they went there they were told it's a beautiful country no one knew what the, what the conditions were here and they advertised it's flourishing country, rich in soil, good in climate, and uh, you will uh, flourish over there. That was told to them. Uh, uh, the government uh, forced them to build the levee, to build, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, cut the woods in the forest and to plant uh, some, uh, some, some, some fruits. But, uh, of course, no one knew at that time what would be the right crop in this country. The German settlers, they, had, they tried the wheat. Of course, that, that uh, didn't go. That uh, was not a success. And the bigger planters, they were mo mostly the French ones, they, uh, they tried then, they needed slaves for doing it, indigo. For the small farmers, it was not possible. But uh, later on, they came to, rye, came to rice and then vegetable, vegetables. And it took about uh, 10 to 15 years until that time. They provided uh, near your town, Nouvelle Orleans, with, uh, with all those things that came on the market, rice, vegetables. But they didn't know that the inundation could come from the back swamp as well as from the river. There were the crevasses, there were the, the inundations uh, uh, coming from the back to their homes, to, to their fields. They didn't know about the low temperatures of winter, and uh, so all these uh, things, uh, hurricanes and the strong wind velocity, was completely unknown to them, and uh, they suffered. They, they died, and some of them uh, went away, and so it was, must have been a terrible time. And, and things changed very, changed very slowly during the French period, but uh, the German settlers seemed to be r rather well off, as they were called uh, people, uh, they, 
a purple, laborieux, industrious people also, it seems that, uh, let's say about uh, after 40 to 50 years, they were rather well off, and that continued during the Spanish period. But in that time, uh, at the end of that Spanish time, a complete change again. Then it was after decades, people had tried to establish sugarcane here, didn't work because sugarcane is really not the plant for Louisiana. Also, you have that such a tradition here. And uh, it was De Boré who introduced uh, plants from Saint-Domingue, it's Hispaniola, uh, uh, Dominican Republic today, or Haishi. And uh, when he succeeded, it was within five to ten years that uh, the whole settlement here along the coast, including the Acadian coast, the uh, German coast, all the larger and smaller, smaller um, properties on the river had changed to sugarcane. The German farmers supposedly saved the colony of New Orleans because the French weren't feeding themselves. The Germans came over and, and uh, did the farms, and uh, that supposedly is a, was the salvation of the colony of New Orleans. Most important was uh, uh, to deliver food products to New Orleans. Then it was uh, a military post there as well against, uh, I think, the, the Indians. I don't know whether it's not just Indians or any other type. And uh, you must remember that uh, La Salle came down the river and the French uh, still were in the northern part, so on, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, some way of traffic on, on the Mississippi. But main thing, uh, of course, uh, this is providing of foods to, to the capital of this colony. Of this colony, which within uh, the, uh, let's say, the French empire of that time, didn't mean anything. It was it was the climate here and the natural conditions which prevented that this colony would be of any value for the Fran for France at that time. From the German coast, settlement moved nearer New Orleans. At one time part of Jefferson Parish, the city of Lafayette, known today as the Irish Channel, became home to a number of German immigrants. Their religion was the sustenance they drew on as they built a life in Louisiana. The area has always been densely populated. The city uh, of New Orleans was nothing like what it is today. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, concentration of, of people was, was much larger because of the, the condition of families too. You know, the German people and the Irish uh, people always had large families. And even though it is a small area, geographically speaking, there were a great many people that lived in there. And uh, they, uh, uh, they, the, there's something about the Irish and the German that he will always bring his churches with him. Wherever he went in the world, he brought his churches with him. And uh, because there was freedom in this country, that was a new experience for them too. You see, in the old country, I know especially in Germany, where I served a congregation of 7,500 people, they didn't know each other at all. Came to this country and they found freedom, freedom of association with each other too. That meant that they had freedom also to join, uh, to organize and join churches, particularly the Protestants, the Evangelicals. But even the, uh, uh, the Catholic people realized that the authorities of the Catholic uh, hierarchy realized that peoples had to be served and they had no transportation like they have today where they can uh, pass 10, 12 churches and attend the church of their choice because they're driving an automobile. In those days they walked. And there was a tremendous concentration of people just in that, per, per, perhaps only a mile square of the city of New Orleans in those days. The same thing is true also of Little Saxony. Over there, uh, between uh, Elysian Fields and Press Street, from the river beyond Rampart, you find a, a lot of churches right in there, evangelical and Roman Catholic. And the intermarriage began to take place. Here at St. Mary's Assumption, 
is probably the most glorious example of the German heritage in New Orleans. The German heritage in terms of the, the religious spirit of the Germans who came to New Orleans in the middle of the last century and came to live here and work here, pray here and die here, as many of them did in the course of the yellow fever epidemics that took place in New Orleans. New Orleans was a major port of entry for German people. Uh, also, it was primarily German Catholics who were coming. Um, it, and it, this was a welcoming area for, I mean, the, 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 this was predominantly Catholic and they were comfortable coming here. They didn't all stay here. I mean, uh, there were many who went up to St. Louis or who went on to Texas, but many of them stayed and worked here. Um, and uh, many of them, many of all these immigrants died off yellow fever. I don't think we have any idea what that was like, but you, you read the accounts of how many died in an epidemic. Father Silos, who was the famous redemptorist priest that there's hope of having canonized, died of yellow fever. Uh, St. John the Baptist is another parish where you had so many of the, the priests who worked so hard, they were out nursing the sick, dying of yellow fever. They lost, you know, half their congregation in one year um, with yellow fever. So there was, um, it was a comfortable place for them. They were welcomed when they came here. They didn't feel out of place coming into the Catholic community, but they wanted their religion with them. And they all very much wanted it in their own language. And um, at St. Stephen's and its little spin-off church, St. Henry's is the same way. They, they wanted, uh, and in those churches, um, St. Henry's, they were using German well into the 20th century for a part of their services. To build this church, it was a Father Peter Chackert who was responsible for building this church in the same way Father Duffy worked to get St. Uh, St. Alphonsus. Father Chackert was the priest involved in, in getting this church built. And um, the boats carrying the bricks landed at the river, but there wasn't really a roadway to transport the bricks needed to the building site and sidewalks were not yet <laughs> really in place. So the women of the parish carried the bricks in their skirts and aprons from the riverfront back here and helped bring the bricks back here. The other interesting story that uh, even before they built the first little frame church, uh, they were holding Sunday services in Kaiser's Beer Hall, Beer and Dance Hall, which was in the neighborhood, and uh, the ladies of the church had to get in there real early Sunday morning to clear out the debris from Saturday night <laughs> so that they could have the services here. So it was, it, it didn't take too long um, of worshiping at Kaiser's Beer Hall before they went ahead and built the frame church. <laughs> it's a very strong influence here. Um, they worked in a, as laborers primarily, uh, draymen and beer workers, things like that. There was an element of higher class Germans who came too because I've been told that St. Stephen's was built for them. And the lower working class wanted their own church where they could hear their own dialect and that's why they founded St. Henry's. I mean, it was too, even though they were both German, St. Stephen's was too highfalutin German for St. Henry people. <laughs> and, uh, but it was strong, and even among Protestant groups, um, Zion Lutheran Church on St. Charles Avenue uh, next to Kung's Dynasty, that's another German church. They, they were using German until the middle 1920s in their services. Um, so that's, I guess because of the world wars in Germany having been an, the enemy of the United States, that element of the heritage is played down, but it really was major major numbers of Germans came here, settled here, and left their mark here. There are an awful lot of German families, some of whose names became Frenchified in the process. I mean, all the, the some Webers became Ubers, and Schneck Schneiders became something. I, I mean, it, things happen to German names with French pronunciation, but there are many, many elements of German here. The faith planted on the east bank of the Mississippi River reached across to the west bank of that great continental divisor, flowering in the city of Gretna. I understand that there were four German settlements in the New Orleans area, and Gretna was one of those four. And I understand that the early immigrants were either Lutheran or Catholic because of the great German uh, influence. So it all started with the uh, solicitude of the Redemptorist Fathers of New Orleans and uh, the village Mechanicam, which was directly across uh, from Jackson Avenue. It had a small cluster of farmhouses from the French colonial days. In the 1840s, uh, Freetown was developing, and that was McDonoughville, which is nearby here. And it had gotten the name Freetown uh, because of the um, 
McDonough gave his plantation over to the uh, freed slaves and they, they began it there. But mechanic ham was starting to come alive and um, there had been German settlers on Destrehan's plantation, which this area was. Uh, so in addition to those settlers, um, uh, though they had worked on what was now the Harvey Canal, they were brought over for that work. And their descendants, there also were Irish, French, and American families, were taking up homes in the vicinity. So this was really um, a cosmopolitan sort of town because of the various uh, uh, families that were here. And uh, so this had been known as Mechanicam, and part of it was because, uh, you know, Mechanic Town, uh, a lot of the men worked with the railroad uh, down Algiers in this area, so they were machinist and mechanically inclined. And with more Catholics uh, population coming in together, they decided to have their own church and a resident pastor. Uh, so the uh, <clears throat> Archbishop Antoine Blanc, the first Archbishop of New Orleans, um, he was approached, the, he reproached the Redemptorist Fathers <clears throat> of St. Mary's Assumption uh, and St. Alphonsus churches and asked them to come over and make this a mission station to visit the uh, Catholics here. So Father Anwander, when he became superior of the Redemptorists in uh, 1855, he uh, prevailed upon the people to organize and build a church. And the people readily got together and they discussed the project in 1857. And the first meeting was called for on November the 28th, uh, 1857, by the Catholic leaders of the West Bank, and most of them were German. A committee was appointed to find a suitable location and to acquire some land. And so the annals of the Redemptor's Fathers from that time, they have a record of the first mass offered here in, in Gretna or Mechanicam and it states December the 25th, 1857. On this happy Christmas morning, Reverend Father Superior Thaddeus Anwander celebrated the first mass that was ever offered in Gretna in Mr. O'Donnell's house. The Redemptors uh, came uh, here and as I recall, Gretna was like the mother church. Uh, I think Gretna took all the way down uh, to, uh, I'm not sure how far down, but a, a tremendous area under the supervision of the pastor here in Gretna. My father uh, was an altar boy, a uh, servant. He call, recalls getting up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, getting the horse ready, and going on, on with the horse to West Wego at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning with the priest to, to serve mass in West Wego. That was a, a nine-hour trip. Uh, and in those days, by horseback, you know, and with the roads being, you know, very, very poor, it was quite a journey. So in those days, it, it really was a, a pioneer days to, to minister to the, to the needs. So West Rico was part, I think, of Gretna and the whole West Bank, if I'm not mistaken. As the Catholic Church made the journey, so did Protestant denominations as well. Most of the people in Gretna in those days uh, were, belonged to uh, Salem Lutheran Church or to the St. Joseph's Catholic Church and a few to the Presbyterian Church. These were the old original people. I think there were a few Methodists also. The Matthews family was always Methodist but and a few other people but basically uh, that was the the church configuration. Uh, Roman Catholic and Lutheran and a, some, a smaller group of Presbyterians and a smaller group of Methodists. The church was started in 1870 or so and I don't have all those data with me at the moment, but the church was originally founded by the Germans in this area, and initially, uh, they knew that they were German Protestants. They weren't quite sure what they were. And initially, they joined the Presbyterian Synod of Louisiana, and for a year or two, they were Presbyterian, and then they realized that they were really Lutheran and not Presbyterian, and they became members of the Lutheran Church, and officially, and the church became known as, officially the church was named the Evangelical Lutheran Congregation of the Unaltered Augsburg Confession. And that was the official name until our new constitution quite recently. I know my, my grandmother was, con on the other side of the family, was confirmed, or was baptized actually, not, but she was baptized at the First Street Presbyterian Church, which is on, I don't know if you're familiar where that is, that's 
it's a very old, lovely building on First Street, uh, near, near Magazine. And I don't even know if it's still in existence anymore. It was written up a few years ago about uh, one of the historic things that need to be done. But they, it was apparently also a German Protestant church, and it technically was Presbyterian at that time. But they all became members over here after that. It was started, and um, there were several ministers that were so-called supplies and, and evangelists and so forth. And um, it, it, the, the money for the church had been supplied by the Presbyterians. And one of the ministers was a Lutheran, and I think he was supposed to be changing to the Presbyterian church, and what he did was change the church to the Lutheran church <laughs> instead. Well, anyway, there was a, a big, you know, upset about it. And um, my grandfather came down here from Bloomfield, New Jersey, as a brand new minister to the first German Presbyterian Church in New Orleans, which is now the first street Presbyterian Church, not now because it isn't anymore, but then, you know, after 1918, it was called, changed to that name. But um, <laughs> he was sent here as a new minister with one other man to try to clear up this problem of what was going on in this Gretna Church, and I don't have the date of that either. Um, but he apparently got to the bottom of the trouble, whatever it was, and solved the, solved the problem and got the church back into the Presbyterian Church, and then they appointed him as the minister to come over here. So they lived then on First Street, where the First Street Presbyterian Church was, 800 block, and he'd walk over to the Jackson Avenue Ferry, take the ferry on Sunday afternoon, and every Sunday afternoon he was gone and coming over here to have service at the Gretna Presbyterian Church. I think he did that for 35 years. Dr. Vos, we were acquainted with him because he would come over for the Christmas uh, program, and I never heard the Christmas story read the way he read it. And he would go to this little wheezy organ and play Joy to the World, and we were so impressed. When you say that he played the organ, he was one of the few people who could play the organ and the piano. He had a good touch on both, which is apparently unusual because they are two different methods entirely of playing. Yeah. But he could beautifully play both the piano and the organ. Well, they still and have that, that same little organ over at the Retina Presbyterian Church, you know, it's an artifact. And, and a sidelight on the organ business, which I don't know about the Gretna Church, but the First Street Church, my father was always in the back pumping the organ. Yeah. And that's an insight that you don't realize, that there had to be somebody doing the work, and he was back there pumping the organ. The tradition of a German language service continues at one of the first German-speaking churches in the area, in what was the city of Carrollton. The monthly service in the German language like this today here is meant to give those Germans and German-Americans whoever the opportunity to hear and to participate in a German language service. It may be in, the, in their mother tongue or those who want to uh, further their knowledge of the German language and do so by means of praising God in another language, you know. And we've been doing this for the last 20 years here. Um, this church, St. Matthew Church, is an original German church. It was founded in 1843 and at one time it had a church school and was only doing everything in German. Only at the beginning of the First World War did this change. And when I came over here in 1970 to take over the German Siemens mission, I was then asked to participate in this kind of service, which we normally offer once a month. And so as not to, to interfere with the normal church services, this was put in the afternoon. So that, you know, uh, people could go to their churches, wherever they may belong to, because ours is an interdenominational service. I personally am a Lutheran pastor, and uh, we know there is a need for this kind of thing. A people who wrested a hard-won foothold from an often inhospitable landscape and built strong worship communities inevitably became an important part of American society. The uh, effect or the influence that Germans have had throughout uh, American uh, 
building as a nation, uh, gymnastics, uh, public school education, all of these things uh, originated in Germany. Uh, the uh, German move of uh, liberalism that really erupted in the 1848 revolutions that broke out in, in uh, Berlin and in Paris and in, in Vienna, initially suppressed under Metternich, but, but still a lot of these people, the 48ers, came over and they brought with them this desire for uh, suffrage, for voting, which they didn't have in the old country. And uh, Germans were very instrumental in the, anti in the abolition movement uh, here. Uh, Karl Schurz, the minister of uh, interior under Abraham Lincoln, was one of these 48ers, uh, became a major general in the Union Army, became a lawyer, a uh, senator, uh, and was uh, recently on it on one of our postage stamps. So Germans have not been good about publicizing the influence that they've had, and that's one of the things we're trying to do in the Deutsches Haus. Uh, when the coast attracted uh, German people, and uh, they were predominantly interested, those people were predominantly interested in agriculture, they moved out away from the concentration of people to find whatever lands were available for cultivation. And there they were joined by Italians. Then comes the period in the history of, of New Orleans where when the German people moved out into the Carleton area and uh, in, into the area beyond Lafayette toward the, uh, the bend of the river uh, as it uh, moves uh, northward, you know, the, uh, the, the, the people worked in their gardens and they were the ones who supplied the vegetables for the city of New Orleans and they found lo and behold that the Italians who had also moved into New Orleans by that time and this is around 1870 with the uprisings again in Europe with a great number of Italians coming into the city they joined and they became actually the small farmers of the city while the German people gradually moved into more of the industrial and chemical and mechanical activities of the city. Though the contributions of the German immigrants to Louisiana are too numerous to detail, by tracing briefly the story of Fritz Janke, we may see in microcosm the debt we owe this people, for Fritz Janke as much as anyone made the settlement of the city of New Orleans possible. I feel like our family is not unlike some, some of these TV movies in terms of, of, of a, a European immigrant coming to this country and doing well and, and continuing to do well for a number of generations. I personally get a, a feeling of being able to look at the various buildings that I know that our company and stemming from grandfather's time are here, the landmarks of the city. I was old enough to be active in the company when the charity hospital was built. And I remember we had a um, debate with the union about uh, the operation of our equipment and whatnot. Yeah, I remember all of those sorts of things. I remember one particular interesting thing. Grandfather had the contract, and I have a copy of it. No, I don't. I have the original contract hanging in my study, where he was given the contract to pave all of the walkways around the cycle. This was a, a wet city, uh, that there were no sidewalks, that, that, that this was the, was the first time that it really made the city habitable. I think Grandfather was a very enterprising, energetic fellow that came over from Germany as a young man and was going to make a place for himself. And he did very, very early in life. He seemed to have built up a rather sizable activity. The story that I've always heard was 
that when he came over from Europe, he landed in New York, 18 or 19 or something like that, $20 in his pocket, a typical immigrant coming here. He was to go to work in New York for a man by the name of Schillinger, who had been a friend of his father's in Germany. So I guess he thought that uh, it would be a good idea to get this young man to come over and work for him. Well, apparently, grandfather was a uh, sufficiently hard-headed German that he wanted to get on his own. So he came to New Orleans and opened up a sort of an activity called Schillinger Paving, named after Mr. Schillinger. Well, you'll see out in my garden a copy of one of the stamps that grandfather had and he put in all the paving work he did. And it changed through the years from Schillinger payment to Fritz Janke, Schillinger payment, so forth. Anyhow, he expanded his paving activities and then the need of producing the materials to go into the paving moved him to bring in some producing equipment. He obtained a little cottage there, and out of that he began his business. And as he prospered, he moved into a home which I think was a lovely home. I believe the records have somewhere a picture of it. It was not what I would call a palatial mansion, but what it did express to me was the ability for grandfather to, in such a short period of time after he came here, to be able to develop a growing concern, a growing family, and have a substantial home and in addition to his activities with his own business, he obtained recognition. He was on the board of the German-American Bank here and Deutsches House. That all has activities that were very involving with the family. The New Basin Canal was in existence when he came over, I think. And as the city grew, I've heard a lot of people jokingly say in the presence of members of our family, it really should have been called Janky Ditch because our sand and gravel barges and tugs would come up and down and so forth. There was also those schooners that brought watermelons up, if you may remember. I remember the youngsters would dive off the side of the New Basin Canal and get onto the barges and ride up and down. Or they'd get onto these schooners and throw a watermelon overboard and swipe it. Uh, there were four or five different unloading sites, yards as we call them, that was established on the New Basin Canal. One up at the very tip end of it where the current Union Passenger Terminal is. Just a remark that I think is funny here. You know, for many years, Zulu would come up the New Basin Canal on one of the janky tugs all the way up to the end, and when he would get off up at that end, the first stop he would make would be at the janky office there on Howard Avenue. 
And so we would always get the first coconuts that would be handed out. There's no doubt but that we were indebted by heritage, inheritance, participation when we grew up to be able to participate in the company that that we were fortunate enough to benefit from being a member of the Janky family. Herbert Janky, my cousin, he wound up being Rags, King of the Carnival. That was in 1930, no, 19, I'm sure your record somewhere would show it. And of course, Uncle Ernest, he was King of the Carnival in 1915. My older brother was his page. All of these things don't necessarily mean a lot of social accent was given as a consequence of, but stature in the community was developed through the years, I think, out of this energy that I think stemmed originally from Fritz Janke. I'm very proud of being a Janke, particularly here in, at home in New Orleans, and I feel that that is a legacy that should be remembered and and that for future generations that that our family did contribute to the growth of the city very positively and that's something I'm very proud of. It was taken shortly before grandfather left on a trip to the Caribbean having retired and turned the business over to his three sons and I think it is a very interesting last message. Dave, read it. You can read it the way you are. We bid you goodbye. Don't be afraid or too greedy for business. But do it well and take care of your health from your mother and father. It was after he and grandmother got to Havana that they were walking down the I think, and he dropped dead. So that is the last message to the family from grandfather. Continuity of another kind may be found in other areas of life. In the city of Gretna, Louisiana, the field of politics was long dominated by a heritage of German leaders. Gretna, you know, was all German practically. It was a German settlement. They always used to say, if you want something done, get the Germans to do it, because the Germans over here dug the canals and did all those things. But it was a German settlement. The original spelling of my name was an M with an umlaut, which is a double I-L-L-E-R. So uh, I don't know, our roots go back to somewhere in Germany. I never did really get into it. Too much. I was told that our families and German immigrants were brought over here many years ago to help dig the Harvard Canal. And some of my ancestors lived in uh, Palmetto Huts. Gretna was actually thought to be immigrated by the Germans in 1836. Now, from 1836 to 1908, they had these quickie marriages where no license were required, just two witnesses to sign with the bride and the groom. And at that time, there was no justice of the peace. The minister, not the minister, but the blacksmith that did the work in the city performed the marriages. And that went on to the records indicate till 1908, the first justice of the peace was elected. And at that time it was Michel Downhouse. And he was in office from 1908 to 1916. In 1916, my father, was elected and he uh, served for 28 years till he retired in 1944. <laughs> and during Michel Donhaw's time, my father's time, was when records of marriages were recorded. And they have those records. And after my father died, I 
I ran for the office and I was elected and I served for 40 years and I retired just uh, six years ago. One of the city elections that I recall when I was young, uh, there was a Gelpic Scheffler ticket and a Downhow Miller ticket, so that tells you something about the, the Germans and Gretna. That was back, that was in 1940-41. It wasn't incorporated until, well yes, it was, a, it was a city when he was mayor, but he had to work first to get it incorporated before they elected a mayor, and that's when he did all of his work and he was on the staff of Governor Hall, and he had pull with him that he used to get Gretna Incorporated, but in the meantime, he had to have somebody to run for mayor, and he, I remember he would come home saying how he was working with Mr. Errett to get him to run for mayor, and when he, Mr. Errett accepted, he came home so excited and so happy about it, so Mr. Mayor, Mr. Errett run, ran, and the city was incorporated. Politics was real rough before my time. It quieted down. Uh, you take when the Moreros were in, that was really rough. The Moreros and the languages, and I'm talking, that's, uh, well, in 1913, 19, that age, that started. And it was, it was rough. It was dog eat dog. When they, when they formed a ticket to get Morero out of office, they got him out of office, you see? And uh, Morero was something like Huey Long. If you, was, if you wasn't with him, and you was with him, and you went against him, he's going to get you. And you would be gotten too by it. That's how he was. He'd get rid of you. So uh, what my daddy done, uh, they formed the ticket. Fra Frank Clancy was the clerk of court. My daddy was the assessor. J.B. Downhow was a sheriff, and that while that election was going on, Professor Gosseron, he was a school teacher at the time, and then later he got to be a lawyer. So he come down with a check for five thousand dollars and offered to my daddy, and he says the sheriff sent me down, Jack, to give you this check and take your name off of that ticket and get back right. My daddy told Goss Ron, he said, you bring the check back to the sheriff. I don't want his money. And he, they run, they run, they beat the ticket. And that's why, that's how he got to be the, the assessor. So the, the time come on again to run, he run, he run for assessor on the second time and he won. And, and what Frank Clancy done, he didn't come back as a, a, a clerk of court. He come back as, as, as a sheriff, you see? And, and that ticket won again, you see? And I believe Clancy served about 24 years as sheriff of Jefferson Parish, you see? That's how it went. My father took over as chief of police. It was, from what I was told, it was very similar to one of these wild west towns, you know? And uh, he was a one-man police force, and really from the old timers, uh, told me that they sort of gave him credit for cleaning up Gretna and uh, you know bringing it into a, a much more orderly uh, type of livable community than it was before, because it, you know there was certain well war, sort of like war and political factions at one time. <laughs> Dr. Gelpie was the second mayor. The first mayor for the city of Gretna was John Errett. And John Errett, at that time, he served two-year terms to the four-year term. And uh, Errett served four years, and then Dr. Gelpie came in and served four years. But the thing about Dr. Gelpie is that Dr. Gelpie served 22 years for the city of Gretna, but he served in four different times. He served four years, and then uh, after that, uh, Henry Veering went in for two years, and then Dr. Gelbert come back for four more years, and then uh, Mr. Straley, uh, uh, he served four years, and Dr. Gelbert come back for eight more years, and then Mayor White went in, and Mayor White's been there for, until uh, Ronnie uh, Harris come in, White was there 30, 32 years. He was a good mayor, he was for the interest of the community at heart, and that, that's, I think, why he kept coming back. He thought he could do more than the, the, mayor, the mayor that was in there. He always loved politics, and he always loved people, and he always 
he saw so many things that needed to be done in Gretna that he really worked to try to improve conditions here. And he did do many things. He was the one who instituted the water and sewerage system. They had just open ditches when I was a child. And he had brought the street lights and paved the sidewalks. But most of all, he was interested in getting good, clean water because the cisterns were not good. He'd done a lot of charity work. He was, he was a good, good doctor, you know. And I'm telling you, they didn't have, but I think the only other doctor they had in McDonaldville was Dr. Odom. Of course, he was in politics, too. But both of them did a lot of charity work. And uh, probably Dr. Galbraith done a little more than he did. I used to go to the political rallies, and some of them were pretty hot and hard fought. We used to march in them. Of course, I was an ardent supporter of his. They used to have torchlight parades, I think, and we'd have lanterns, if I remember correctly. But my memory isn't too good, but I remember that they'd always pulled buntings around the speaker stand, and I'd always try to get as close as possible. And the kid, it was so exciting for the kids because uh, they'd have torchlight parades and uh, they'd have the brass band, I guess Footmark band played for some of the uh, occasions. And we wouldn't have missed one of those political meetings for anything in the world. And I can remember Dr. Gelpie up there making a speech. And there was one uh, faction that had been in for years and years and they were called the old regulars. And Evidently, their policies weren't always so regular because Dr. Gelke and some others banded together and they declared for good government and they called themselves the Goo Goos. So it was the Goo Goos against the regulars. And I was just a little kid. My, nobody in my family was eligible to vote, but honey, I was a Goo Goo from the start. It was a lot of aggravation mostly aggravation. You know, people calling you up, worrying you all night long about garbage not being picked up and different things. We had we had uh, two garbage carts in Gratna. They used to pick up all of Gratna every day. Pull about two mules. <laughs> that, was the, that was the height of the garbage in Gratna at that time. Well, we only had around, at the, only had around eight, nine hundred population in Gretna, in the three wards. My father served as chief of police since 1925. Before then, uh, my grandfather served in a police capacity. I remember reading his obituary, and uh, he was referred to as Captain Miller, so I assumed that he was a captain on the Jefferson Parish Police Force. And at some time uh, during his career, he was appointed by Governor Blanchard as assessor in ex officio tax collector, but that had to be sometime before 1911 because he died in 1911. So uh, our years of public service goes back to, I imagine, the beginning of this century. There is another darker side to the German experience in Louisiana. Twice in this century, America has been involved in a global war with Germany. For Americans of German ancestry, a price was sometimes demanded for their life in this new country. It was an era when you, um, well, between two world wars, you dared not even admit you were German. And that went on for so long that um, my family got to just dissolve their Germanness, you know, and not, not accentuate it or try to promote it in any way. When I went to Newcomb and they heard I was taking German, they thought it was terrible. But I loved it, and I had a marvelous teacher, Lydia Elizabeth Fratcher. And she was a marvelous person. You knew her. Did that right. hurt a lot, the, that period around the two world wars? And well, it was not, I don't say that it was hurt, but it did subdue your you know, you just simply didn't say anything about what your background was. You just simply let it fall apart and go unknown. Um, it's a little unfortunate. Both my grandfathers caught a little bit of it. My uh, gross papa's patents were all seized as an enemy alien by the United States. 
and he, uh, my grandfather Voss. Let's go back to Gross Papa. Was All his put patents? in prison. Tell me about that. Well, they he was German. You know, he they they just took his patents away from him. That was what was told to us in the in the family. You know that he couldn't. Well, I don't know how they took them away, but they said they seized his patents. What kind of effect did that have on his business? He had abs when the, when the ice factory went um, under. He uh, he was a very sensitive man. He was at, totally destroyed, really. And uh, Emma, my grandmother, was really a dominant figure, very quite a businesswoman, and um, she was constantly trying to maneuver the business of <laughs> situation to, to, to come out of the whole thing whole, you know. And when they finally moved to um, the other side of the river, to New Orleans, um, they, my, when, my grand, when my grandmother died, my grandfather lived entirely with us. He didn't work anymore after that. I mean, he, he had tried to be a, um, he did work too. He was a supervisor in one of the ice factories for a while. But he really, didn't really do anything after that. But Grandpa Voss landed in, was detained by the police. So I don't know how many hours, he was late for dinner and he didn't get home until late at night because he was writing very much, um, <laughs> it's coming out now, you know, 75 years later, uh, about the Lusitania being, uh, having a, uh, carrying munitions. And you just didn't say that during World War I. And he wrote this pamphlet on that subject, which the family always said, don't ever let anybody see that. It's dynamite. And um, I found one copy of it in his library, which I inherited. And I've kept it. I've since found out that he had given it to the library. So it's in the public library, too. But they didn't like that. And uh, they had him held for investigation and questioning for a while. For all our view of German people as pragmatic achievers, we must not forget that they are also a people of music. Whenever Germans got together in their beer gardens uh, or in their singing societies or sanger hollers, their singer halls, they would always sing. And they, they would sing the heavy classics, but they also sang the folk songs. It's really a much more intrinsic part of their society uh, than it is uh, in a lot of others. Um, they particularly were fond of singing clubs, male singing clubs. And in the late 19th century, here in New Orleans, there were at least a dozen that I've been able to find of, of German male singing clubs that sort of formed the center of the German society. They were not just singing clubs, but they were also social clubs. And uh, so you would have, uh, at the core of the club, you would have a chorus of maybe 40 or 50 men. And then you might have uh, an additional membership of up to five or 600 of men who were just there to belong to the club. And they would um, come to the concerts, of course, but they would also uh, meet and drink beer and uh, have dances and uh, go on country excursions and riverboat trips and just a whole bunch of other stuff. You begin to find singing clubs popping up in Germany and Austria around uh, the early 1800s. And it was simply something that German settlers brought with them. But over here, they did become more of a way to maintain cultural heritage. Uh, and you find a real strong sense of ethnic identity. And they were all over the country. Uh, I mean, not only here in New Orleans, but you find them in Texas and in, certainly up in the Midwest, in New York City, just everywhere. Their contribution, particularly through these singing clubs, was very definitely cultivating an atmosphere toward music and uh, an atmosphere in which music could flourish and keeping alive an appreciation of music at a time when it really was not valued 
that much in American society, particularly in the in the 19th century, music was sort of seen as an almost effeminate thing to do. Real Americans didn't do it. And, and so I think the fact that it was so vital to the German culture helped preserve a love of all different kinds of music that, uh, that was probably their, their best contribution. have examined the German heritage of Southeast Louisiana, one important element of the culture of our state, one part of who and what we are. 